A castle made of wood? The very notion seems preposterous. Everyone knows that castles are made of stone. But that wasn't always the case. There was once a time when the English built castles with wood. These medieval structures are long gone. Their timbers have either been replaced with lasting stone, or the wood has simply disintegrated with all the other ashes of time. But for several hundred years in England's history, from the time of the Norman Conquest in 1066 to the pathetic reign of Edward II in the 1300s, castles made of timber were ubiquitous. Military necessity dictated their creation. Social standing dominated their architecture. Some were modest fortresses or frontier outposts. Others were of grand design, and many were disguised to look like stone. Their first purpose was to protect knights and their horses. But soon, they housed entire communities, some of which became the cities of modern England. Though they were not temporary structures, little evidence remains to chronicle the existence of these majestic timber castles, nothing but mounds and ditches in the countryside. But once upon a time, lords and ladies lived in castles of wood. In 1959, archaeologist Philip Barker visited a rural farm near Montgomery, Wales, a village on the English border. The farm itself was undistinguished, but for a modest grass-covered hill. It was cone-shaped and about 25 feet high. Surrounding it was an elevated meadow about the size of a large horse corral. The mound and meadow had been there as long as anyone could remember. But to the archaeologist, it was a Mott and Bailey, and the site was that of a medieval English earthwork known as Hand de Men, Welsh for the Old Mound. Barker came to Hand de Men to dig for pottery. He knew from documentary evidence that the location belonged to an ancient community more than 900 years old. By excavation, he hoped to find nothing more than a cachet of 11th and 12th century ceramics. But what he found at Hendemen went far beyond his imagination. The whole thing was a complete surprise. I mean, I have to tell you that I was a completely inexperienced excavator, and this was a great, a great advantage, because we just took it from the top. We took the grass off, and we troweled the, the uppermost surfaces clean to see what was there and we found little rings of stones and little shallow holes and all sorts of things which we realised could not be accidents. They must represent something, you see. And we decided that they must represent timbers, structural timbers. Evidence of timber castles exists in many forms in art, literature, even ancient tax records. But seldom is any tangible archaeological proof uncovered. At Hendemen, evidence remaining here beneath the serene Welsh soil was the blueprint of an ancient Mott and Bailey type castle. Mott and Bailey is a type of earthwork castle that was introduced by the Normans into England and Wales from the time of the Norman Conquest onwards, 1066. And the moss refers to a large, almost Christmas pudding-shaped mound, like a giant molehill. And the bailey is the defended courtyard, which is set below the mott. So it's two component parts. Atop the mott was a palisade with some form of timber tower, which may have served as the main private residence of the castle. The bailey contained attendant buildings such as chapels, stables, and kitchens. A mott bridge connected the two. It was usually protected by a guard tower. To find the site of a mott and bailey castle in Great Britain is not unusual. 
There are hundreds throughout the United Kingdom. But Hendermen was unique, untouched by modern civilization. We found that, very remarkably, the site hadn't been plowed or destroyed in any way since it was abandoned, which we eventually found was about 1300. So it was a beautifully intact site, which we were able to dissect over a period of some 25 years. From 1960 until 1985, Barker and his team peeled away the layers of time, slowly finding pieces to an ancient puzzle. We stripped off these layers, one after another, rather like taking the layers off an onion, but more difficult than doing that. And one of the things that we found was that as we went down through the sequence of buildings, more of them were constructed with posts going deep into the ground, in holes which we call post holes. The dig took excavators on a journey through time. Hand to men, they discovered, had a lifespan of nearly 250 years. What's more, it had evolved through several different stages of building. Based on their discoveries, they were able to reconstruct the timeline for the castle and its domain. Hand to men, they learned, had been built by the Normans in the 1070s and remained inhabited until the 1300s. There were hundreds of layers, but we divided eventually into about eight phases of construction from the earliest to the last. One of the periods of buildings which was clearest, mainly because the posts were in the ground, was phase about 1150. And we got a complete sequence of buildings over that half of the bailey for that date. Few actual artifacts remain to be found. One prominent exception was a wooden sill beam discovered beneath layers of dirt. Barker's team determined that it had supported the bridge between the mott and the bailey, which carried a deep moat. Other clues were more subtle. Changes in the color of the soil indicated where thick wooden beams had rotted, often indicating post holes that outlined foundations of buildings and walls. From the archaeological evidence, Barker's team was able to make a blueprint of Hendemen, and from the blueprint, they reconstructed an architectural rendering of the castle, a drawing. My colleague, Peter Schofield and I constructed that drawing from a particular point of view to give the maximum information. And we argued, of course, all of us among ourselves, as to what the, the roof should be like, what they would be covered with, what would be sensible. I mean, it wouldn't be sensible in our view to have thatch, you see, it's too vulnerable to fire, and so on and so on. And we went all through this, and we came up with the drawing that you saw. From his drawing, Peter Schofield built a model. What's interesting is that, and one of the things that this model doesn't show is the, is the succession of buildings that there was on the site. I mean, this is very much a snapshot of, of Hand on a day at a certain time. I mean, the time may have been a, a span of, I don't know, as little as kind of 10 or 15 years. Some of the buildings lasted right through four or five phases of the castle's occupation. It wasn't that it was destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt. Parts of it were destroyed and rebuilt, you see. And, and so it came and went, just as we might take our greenhouse away or we might add a bit to the, the back of the house. Now, I'm not going to say that we th think we've got the answers right in all cases. I'm sure we haven't. But what I do like to think is that if Baldwin de Bolaire, whoever it was who owned the castle at the time, came back, he'd recognise it. You see, he wouldn't say that's a load of rubbish. He'd say, oh, yes, that looks like our castle. I'm sure we've got some of the details wrong, but I think in general we've got it right. Through the years of excavation, Barker's team reconstructed an ancient timber castle. They determined what it had been and when it had existed, but the soil could not reveal all the answers. 
Before Stonehenge, there was Woodhenge. The ancient tribes of southern England built this mysterious altar during the Bronze Age, more than a thousand years before fashioning their timeless monument of giant stones. Though it holds many secrets, the very existence of Woodhenge, just three miles from Stonehenge, proves that the English often built with timber before stone. The advent of English timber castles can probably be traced to the events of October 14th, 1066. About five o'clock that afternoon, as the sun drifted beyond the western horizon, a Norman arrow found the eye of Harold, the last Anglo-Saxon king of England. Harold's death was the beginning of Norman rule in England and the first dawn of an empire that still exists today. At the Battle of Hastings, the Saxons fought on foot with archaic axes and shields, while the Normans used cavalry, lances, and crossbows. The invaders were led by the Duke of Normandy, William the Bastard by birth, William the Conqueror to history. Armed with a papal decree naming him rightful heir to the English throne, along with the most advanced army the world had ever seen, William conquered England that October day, and on Christmas, he was crowned King William I in Westminster Abbey. Very quickly, the Normans set about defending their conquered island. In a land teeming with oak, they built timber fortresses atop mounds of earth, surrounded by palisades and imposing ramparts, Mott and Bailey-type castles. One enduring mystery is where did this Mott and Bailey design originate? We still don't really know so how the castle and the Mott and Bailey originated. It seemed to be probably in the France area, perhaps in the 10th century, uh, early 11th. It has been argued that the sort of Normans didn't build Motts till they came to this country, but that isn't generally accepted. Well, there's a bit of difficulty about this. We're not quite sure. It's been disputed for some time whether, in fact, it was created in Normandy or in other parts of Northwest Europe and brought to England after the Norman Conquest. The most vexing piece of evidence is found in the La Tapisserie de la Reine Matilda, the Bayou Tapestry. This expansive 11th century quilt tells the story of William's conquest of England, and it suggests that the Normans were building motts in Normandy before the conquest. It was designed, embroidered, probably 10, 15 years after the conquest. Got to remember, it's a bit of propaganda. It's not an objective documentary account of the conquest. So I would be very reluctant to say that the Normans really knew all about modern Bailey castles at least two years before the conquest, just because they turn up on a tapestry made 10 years after the conquest. And one thing is for sure, if they did know about modern Bailey castles, they surely weren't building them all over Normandy. They were evolving their castle building during the actual years of conquest. Within about five years, from 1066 onwards, they had devised a sort of castle which none of them had built anywhere else before. The modern Bailey castle was a product of the process of conquering England. What is safely deduced in the evolution of a modern Bailey castle is that the Bailey came first. At the time of the conquest, a mot isn't much use to you. The Normans have put their emphasis, they put their money into their cavalry. Expensively armored knights on expensively trained horses, which must be protected. So the first thing you've got to put up at the time of conquest is protective horse corrals. I think those are the first castles. They are simple enclosures within which a knight can get off his horse and take off his chainmail in safety. Within two or three years after that, they are absolutely the fashion. They're being built everywhere. 
anyone who's got the money and the license from the king will do it. Remember, you've got to have both. In a land of more than a million Anglo-Saxons, King William relied on just a few thousand Normans to rule the country. He did so by embracing the existing Saxon feudal system of land ownership, but he installed his own lords and vassals. In theory, all of England belonged to the king. He retained a portion for himself, but divided the remainder among his most important followers. They, in turn, kept a portion for themselves, then parceled out remainders to their loyal followers. This process often sifted through three or four stages. The parcel of land was known as the fief. The donor of the land was the lord, and the recipient, the vassal. Within this hierarchy, William I consolidated his claim to all of England and defended it by giving land based on military service. It therefore transpired that the first English lords after 1066 were the Knights of the Conquest. As the Normans took over the various manors and lands in uh, England and on the edge of Wales, they built castles to hold them down. And we believe, we're pretty certain, that our castle at Montgomery was built about 1070 or 1071, which is within four years of the conquest, you see. Before 1066, Montgomery in Wales did not exist. Only the River Severn snaking through an idyllic valley on the border of England and Wales. It was beautiful, rich farm country. But it was also an ancient route of invasion. Fearing Welsh marauders, William needed to secure the border. In about 1070, the Welsh border was divided into three more or less equal areas and given to three of William the Cockerer's henchmen. And the man who was given the central portion, that is, uh, was made Earl of Shrewsbury, was a man called Roger de Montgomery, who came from Montgomery in the Calvados region of Normandy. Roger Montgomery was one of the young men who hitched his wagon, if you like, to the new duke and was one of the group of perhaps a dozen young men who fought their way into power a generation before the conquest of England. So when Duke William came to England, Roger Montgomery came with him as one of his most trusted friends. Roger de Montgomery was given the important task of securing the Welsh border and in doing so, became the most powerful man in County Shropshire. When he comes to the Welsh borders, and he builds, amongst other castles, one earthen timber castle to command a ford across the Severn, where Welsh raiders might come, something reminds him of his birthplace. And he gives that castle the name of Montgomery. Montgomery was one of several timber castles built by Roger de Montgomery, the Earl of Shrewsbury, and one of many on the Welsh border. As the Normans entrenched, the Welsh became more belligerent, and Norman security was threatened. When Ancient Mysteries continues, the story of an attack on a timber castle and how doomsday descended upon the citizens of England. Twenty years after he was crowned King of England, William the Conqueror decided to survey the wealth of his realm in detail. He wanted to know how many lords and vassals, peasants and serfs were living on his land. How bountiful were his farms, how rich were his forests, how plentiful his livestock and game. William did this for one reason, taxation. For a year, the king's agents combed the shires of England, counting sheep and sheaves of wheat, recording every whisker of wealth in abbreviated Latin on a giant ledger. When the king's counters arrived in a new town, residents said the day of judgment had arrived. And so it came to pass. The king's ledger was named the Doomsday Book. 
so very narrowly did he have it investigated, that there was no single hide, nor a yard of land, nor indeed one ox, nor one cow, nor one pig which was there left out, and not put down in his record. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Among other details in the massive tax records of 1086, Doomsday touted the whereabouts of many Norman castles in England. There was the White Tower of London, the ancient hill fort called Old Serum on the Salisbury Plain, an imposing earthwork known as British Camp near Great Malvern. In Staffordshire, there was the small timber castle with a growing community around it. And on the Welsh border, the castle of Montgomery. In 1086, the timber castle at Montgomery was a fortified community of Norman soldiers and villagers who lived very sparse and rugged lives. They were highly intelligent and may have been very appreciative of things which we can't possibly dig up. We don't know anything about their poetry or music. They may have, in the evenings after the hunt, sang to the lute or some other similar instrument. They may have recited poetry. We, we have to be careful not to see them as nasty, brutish and short. I don't think that's necessarily the case at all. I think they lived an out-of-door life, very tough. They spent their time hunting a lot of, they were hunting the wild boar, by the way, not the deer. There were a lot of wild boar bones. I don't think it was a sheltered, comfortable life at all. They were just very hardy, especially on the Welsh border. And they were always liable to be attacked. They were right out on the edge. The hostility of the Welsh was understandable. Norman invaders had seized their land, so the Welsh fought back. They were fearless warriors, skilled in guerrilla tactics, and their threat remained constant for centuries. They raided Hendomon, and in 1095, they killed the garrison. But they didn't occupy it. They went off again. They just killed the garrison and went back into the hills. That was the nature of their warfare. Evidence of the Welsh attack on Hendermen appeared in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. These writings also detailed many other attacks on other castles. We have lots of evidence of castles being taken by the Welsh from the Normans in the 12th century, in the 13th century, being recaptured by the Normans and rebuilt, some being thoroughly destroyed within a few years. In the north, which has always been the great stronghold of the Welsh princes, they pushed the Normans out, and North Wales remained virtually independent of the English crown until the Edwardian conquest of the 1270s and 1280s. That's sort of two centuries after um, the Battle of Hastings. The average attack on a castle would last a few days, probably, not much more. A serious attack might involve fire if the timber work wasn't adequately protected. If you couldn't set fire to the place, you would probably have a go at the main gates with the battering ram, which is why gatehouses become some of the most imposing structures in castles, whether they're timber castles or stone castles. They're the weakest point in the castle defences, but they're also the threshold where you enter the Lord's domain. The natural consequence of attacks on timber castles was the improvements of defenses. This often included making a timber castle look like a stone castle. In the times when these castles were going concerns, say 11th, 12th, early 13th centuries, you didn't see any earth. You were lucky if you saw timber. These are timber structures. The earth is used to infill them and give them solidity, which a stone wall would have, but a timber wall doesn't. Now, timber has a couple of severe disadvantages as a building material. It rots if the rain gets at it, and you can set fire to it if you want to attack it. So what do you do to prevent that happening? You coat it. And if you walk around most English villages and towns still today, you can find timber-framed houses which are coated over with plaster to protect them. And I reckon that virtually all the timber work in so-called earthwork castles was plastered over. I have a feeling that Norman lords 
had different sorts of castles for different purposes, but it didn't really matter so much to them what they were made of. They made them of what they had available. If there was stone available, they used stone. If there isn't, they'll use timber, but they'll disguise it to look like stone. There was an awful lot of disguising. Disguising timber castles to look like stone had two vital purposes. The first was military, to create the look of an impregnable fortification and deter attack. The second was more social, relating to the image of wealth and power a lord hoped to project. The proliferation of timber castles was a phenomenon in Norman England. But at the same time, other events were shaping the future of the modern world. By the year 1100, the colonization of Polynesia had begun, as South American sailors explored the pristine waters of the South Pacific. In 1103, the first fireworks appeared in China. And in 1137, the high clerics of the Holy Roman Empire began building St. Stephen's Cathedral in the heart of Vienna. By the year 1200, the Normans were building majestically bigger, if not better, timber castles. Many were imposing structures built for the vital purpose of defense. But these castles also served to project the image of wealth and power of the Lord who owned them. And they became prominent extensions of the noble ego in Middle Age society. This meant every medieval lord faced the daunting social specter of keeping up with the Joneses. Your castle building dormans are the wealthiest and most powerful 200 people in the country. They're concerned with grandeur. They're concerned with style. They're an immensely competitive, not just military competitive, they're socially competitive. They're using their houses as platforms to display their power, to exercise the power. They're using them as springboards to acquire more power. So a castle, in a sense, is just the protective shell around a very grand house. And that's what the Norman barons are really interested in. Not constant fighting. They want to live very comfortably, in great style, in very impressive houses, inside their defences. So in a way, we ought to get too concerned with the outward shell, just because that's what happens to survive. We've got to keep looking inwards towards the houses inside and the people who are in those houses. The social structure within the limited realm of a timber castle is not easy to determine. But through archaeology, some clues remain. The first and most prominent bits of evidence are found in the surviving earthworks. From aerial photographs, archaeologists can readily identify the basic plan of a modern Bailey castle. Most revealing are the contours of the land, showing where deep ditches and high banks had once been. These, combined with archaeological findings, give a good picture of the landscape of the time. The earthworks of Stafford Castle provide a good example. Located to the north of present-day Birmingham in England, Stafford offers archaeologists and historians a good chance to study the social hierarchy within a timber castle. Until recently, little was known about Stafford, other than the fact that it had a crumbling 19th century manor house on top of its mott. In the 1980s, a small portion of the site was excavated. Stafford is an important castle. It's just outside the modern town of Stafford. We're not too certain what happened on the top of the mott because that got replaced in, the, I think, the 14th century by a stone tower, which was later developed into a sort of country house, I think, in the 19th century. But enough was excavated for a whole series of, of reconstructions to, to be made. A lot of it must be hypothetical because only a small sections of the castle were excavated. 
some of the excavations give some idea of what the defences were like in, in one area, how the town and or the village and the castle fit into the local settlement. The diggers learned that Stafford had once been a massive timber community containing an enormous mot and at least three baileys. The innermost bailey housed the most important people to the Lord, his bishop, his lieutenants, cooks, wards, and stable attendants. The middle bailey was larger. It housed the craftsmen of the community, including highly skilled carpenters who were paid to build the timber castles. The outer bailey was the largest of the three comprising the village. It housed peasants and serfs who were typically forced to build the castles and work in the farms and forests around the community. Seen together and in context with the medieval town, the entire structure delineated the upper, middle, and lower classes of this pocket society. What the excavation of Stafford could not determine was how these people adorned their wooden homes inside and out. Had they carved figures upon the wooden beams? Did they make elaborate windows of stained glass? The evidence suggests they did. It is also known that these timber structures were not considered temporary housing by their inhabitants. They were built to last hundreds of years, but still, their days were numbered. It's a mistake to think of timber as being a temporary method of construction. I mean, it's clear that they thought of them as permanent within their lifetimes or within their two or three lifetimes. But there's no doubt about it that stone is more permanent and more prestigious. There's a constant interplay between timber and stone. Even where somebody has decided that he's going to put up a stone castle right from the start, he's got to have a secure perimeter. Well, he organizes the supplies coming in, the stone being dumped, cut, foundations dug. Now, that will take place behind temporary defenses. Those temporary defenses will almost certainly be of earth and timber. So even if you're building a stone castle, you start your stone castle on day two, but day one, you spend putting up your temporary defenses, almost certainly in timber and earth. So even stone castles have got that very short-lived timber stage. And there were huge numbers of stone castles in England where all the residential buildings were made of timber. Stafford was no exception. It didn't take the excavators long to determine that the wooden keep upon Stafford's giant mot had been replaced with a stone keep as early as the 1300s. It was a pattern that became familiar throughout the English countryside as lords and barons began to build more impressive castles of stone. When we continue, we'll look at the demise of timber castles, find out why they disappeared, and what stands in their places today. And we'll see how modern civilization has used some of these medieval earthworks in very creative ways. For roughly 250 years, the majestic castles of England evolved from towers of timber to pillars of stone. It was an evolutionary period that began with William the Conqueror, who built a timber fort atop a small mot at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, and it ended metaphorically with the reign of Edward II, the ninth Norman King of England, who died a horrible death in 1327 in the dungeon of Berkeley Castle. A castle built with timber, then rebuilt with stone. Somehow, Edward's gruesome demise is symbolic of what happened to all the lost timber castles of England. They couldn't fight fire. As a building material, oak was perfect for timber castles. It was abundant in the forests of England, easy to cut when green, pliable to work, and solid as stone with age. It was handsome when polished, watertight when maintained, but for all its inherent beauty and strength, oak was fatally flawed. Ultimately, it was fire, or the fear of fire, that felled the timber castles of England. Some actually burned down, others were abandoned, left to rot, and many were refitted with stone. <laughs> 
By the 1300s, few, if any, Norman lords were building new timber castles. The noble structures at Montgomery in Wales are good examples of the transition from timber to stone. Sometime in the mid to late 1200s, the Lord of Montgomery decided to build a new castle. He chose a better site on a bigger hill and built a majestic castle completely of stone. The new Montgomery Castle was built from 1223 to about 1330. It established a major new stone castle on the ridge above us, above the town. The surprising thing was that the castle at Hendomen, which you would have thought would have been totally superseded and abandoned, there was enough evidence from the archaeology to show that it continued for another two or three generations. And it may have been kept up simply because it did command this ford. It did overlook this crossing point, which couldn't be seen from by the new castle on, on the hill above. So it was almost like a, an advance outpost to the new castle. Successive lords maintained the first castle at Montgomery for nearly 250 years. But by the middle of the 1300s, the old timber sites were abandoned and forgotten. All that remained was the Martin Bailey, which people began to call Hendermen, meaning the old mound. Other Martin Bailey sites were also abandoned. Northeast of Montgomery, there remains the Martin Bailey of Pulverbatch, a classic timber castle from the Middle Ages. It survived well, Castle Pulverbatch, um, partly because of the stickiness, if you like, of the earth, which was used to infill presumably the timber caissons, and also because it's been less subjected to ploughing and modern degradation. This gives us a much better idea of what these castles looked like. All we've got to do is add in our mind's eye, our imagination, the palisades. Pull the match is a very nice little site, very instructive, field archaeologist's dream. Other modern Bailey castles grew out of the timber roots. A lot of modern Bailey castles retain their earthworks right down to the present day. I mean, the most spectacular one is Windsor Castle, which has got a, a massive mot and terrific baileys, as you know, where, but have all been rebuilt in stone, you see. And there are a lot of stone castles which retain the mot and bailey type. Barclay Castle is, is a good example of a castle which has gone from the transition of earth and timber to masonry. We know that it was a Mott and Bailey castle because the mound itself has been totally encased by a masonry curtain wall, totally burying and encapsulating this mound. His main claim to fame is, of course, that Edward II, when he was overthrown by his wife and her lover, in, well, he died in 1327, he was imprisoned at Barclay and was, was killed there. He was said to have had a red hot poker inserted at one end of him. Rather gruesome way to go. Some timber castles ceased to be castles at all, like Ledgershaw Castle just north of Salisbury in Wiltshire. It became a favorite hunting lodge for King John I, signer of the Magna Carta in 1215. He replaced the wooden timbers with walls of stone. By the end of the Middle Ages, England's timber castles had all but disappeared. But the style of castle architecture they introduced remained fundamentally the same. Mott and Bailey. Ludlow Castle is a classic example. That's one of the finest castles you'll find anywhere in the British Isles. It seems to have been masonry from the start. The Norman work seems to be later 11th century. It seems to have begun as a stone castle with mural towers. And has this one of the rare examples of a circular Norman um, nave of the chapel inside the inner ward. So we see masonry there, we see phasing dating really from the late 11th century right through to the, to the 16th and, and 17th century, a long chronology, a very important site in, indeed. Inside these ancient castles which survived from the timber age, one might expect to find clues about the people who lived there, but too often the most meaningful human evidence has vanished. You go to many stone castles, they have an image like a crab shell on the beach, you know? You walk the beach, you find the crab shell, and it looks complete, except that the animal that's inside that made it live, move, it's gone. It's soft, it's rotted. Now, with a castle, you may stand outside, and its walls appear complete, 
towers are there. Even the battlements may survive on the top of the walls. You go inside, the family that lived there isn't there anymore. All that heart of the castle is gone. Stafford is typical. Even though the timber keep was modernized with a massive stone structure, the community still drifted away from the hilltop sometime in the 1400s. It remained strategically important, but socially it ceased to serve any human purpose once its timber dwellings were abandoned. The same occurred in places like Montgomery. Castle denizens eventually left the safety of the earthworks and formed communities that comprised the cities of modern England. The same can't be said of timber castles where nothing but motts, ditches, and baileys remain. Probably the most enduring mystery is where did the people all go? Having put in that prodigious effort to build the castle in the first place, having maintained it as a family home and military base and center of administration and justice, for several hundred years, perhaps. There came a day when they closed the doors, walked away, left it. Oddly enough, the people who left the castles did not leave their communities. The best proof of this is in the familiar relationship between church and castle. For every Norman castle built in the Middle Ages, there existed a Norman church or cathedral. The tiles are still on the roof, the stained glass is still in the windows, and the statues remain in the great halls which are used today just as they were hundreds of years ago. But walk 50 yards the other way, and there is the ancient castle which has been nothing but a ruin for 500 years. These ruins tell you that the world changed, that some enormous tide of history went out and left these military works stranded like whales above the waterline. But that, in a way, is the mystery. It's the most evocative part of any castle, whether it's a stone castle, which still gives a very clear impression of what it was like in its grandeur, or whether it's an earthwork castle, where you have to work much harder to visualize the grandeur. They wear the family homes of their Norman lords, and it's trying to pick up the feeling of family use. It's standing there in the nettle-grown ditches, trying to hear the voices of the Norman owners and their wives and families. That, for me, is the real mystery. While archaeologists and historians continue to ponder these timeless questions, modern civilization is content to put some ancient timber castles to contemporary use. Several miles south of Montgomery in Wales, there is a centuries-old Martin Bailey that has been converted to a golf course. Where a wooden tower once stood on the Mott, there is now an elevated golf tee. And upon the generous Bailey, where medieval people used to live, there are two putting greens. Little could the Norman lords of the Middle Ages know that their imposing fortifications would become platforms for modern recreation. Lost beneath it all is the human record. The inhabitants of so many timber castles left us so few clues about the way they lived and died. But at least we know where they lived and what they lived in. The timbers may be gone, the moths eroded, the bailey plowed, the ditches filled, but the romantic history of England's lost timber castles will linger so long as the sun keeps rising on the British Empire.